Thank you for watching the Digging Deep Bible Study. To watch live and to dig deeper in discussion, join our Zoom Bible Study on Sunday mornings at 9.30 a.m. Click the link in the description below. Let's pray together. If you'd like, repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I believe in the power of your word to change my life. Make me more like you through your word today. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Along those same lines, I was thinking about that song that I think might be the saddest song in the world. It may be one of the most famous songs. It's by Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. Have you heard the lyrics of the song? It says, and now the end is, near, is here, so I face that final curtain. My friend, I'll make it clear. I'll state my case of which I'm certain. I've lived a life that's full. I traveled each and every highway. And more, much more, I did it. I did it my way. And he's like, sounds like he's proud of the fact that he did it his way. He, I planned in each charted course, each careful step along the way. And much, much more, I did it. I did it my way. I might have bit off more than I could chew, but through it all, when there was doubt, I ate it up and spit it out. I faced it all, and I stood tall and did it my way. I mean, uh, for what is a man, what has he got? If not himself, then he has not. Not to say the things that he truly feels, and not the words of someone who kneels. Not the words of someone. Who, let the record show, I took all the bows and did it my way. And uh, Lord, help us of that worldly philosophy that says we got to do it our way, right? That's kind of in us as Americans, right? We want to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and we want to accomplish things ourselves and do it my way. But that spirit of independence and that spirit of rebellion that can be in us like that, Lord, forgive us of that and deliver us from doing it our way, right? Let's continue our series in Philippians 3. We're going to do the first three verses. I tried to get farther than three verses, I promise. <laughs> My notes say we're going through 11 verses, but I'll just tell you right now, I think we're going to get about three verses. We'll see. I'm going to read the first three verses and, and, and go through it for sure. Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, or your, your translation might say, finally, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. Watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. Let's stop right there. No confidence in human effort. That sounds very different from I did it my way, right? So... Look at that first phrase, whatever happens, or yours may say finally. Doesn't it sound like a preacher that says finally, like they're going to close the sermon, you know, and they keep going for like another 20 minutes. That's kind of what he's doing here. But really, it's kind of just a transition word. It's the, in Greek, it's hos loipos, and it means in addition or remaining or uh, moreover or furthermore, something like that. It's not a therefore, like he's referring to what happened right before that, you know, but it's just in addition. He keeps going. So he's transitioning now. And what he says right here, well, first of all, he once again says, my dear brothers and sisters. This is such a love letter. Don't forget that as we read through this love letter. He, he says once again, it's not at the beginning of the, uh, we're not at the beginning of the book, right? It's not a greeting or something like that, but right here in the middle of the book, he just says it again, my dear brothers and sisters. He, you can tell he just has so much love for them. We see so much love and appreciation and joy through this book as he's thanking them. It's a really a thank you letter for the uh, support that they sent him through Epaphroditus. But he just says, my dear brothers and sisters. And then he says, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. This is a theme for him. This is a major theme of this book. We've talked about how it's in this book so many times to rejoice in the Lord. 
But this time what I want to camp out on is rejoice in the Lord. This little phrase, in the Lord. When it says in the Lord, it means Lord Master or it means Lord Sir. It was a title to address a person of higher status and even used as a title for someone who owned property or who owned slaves back in that day. It was a Lord Master kind of thing. So we're supposed to rejoice in our Lord Master. And I want you to remind yourself again and stir up your faith to believe in Him again as your Lord Master, that He is in charge. Are you putting your faith in His spiritual authority? I want you to really ask yourself that again today. Are you putting your faith and your hope and your joy in His spiritual authority in your life? You may be walking through grief. You may be walking through hardship or loss of a job or some kind of diagnosis that you've received, something like that. But we rejoice in His authority over our lives and we put our faith in Him. That's, where we, that's why we can rejoice. It's because we can rejoice in the Lord. And it's because we are in the Lord that we can have joy. Joy isn't based on our circumstances or happen, happenstances. So I want to talk about this even more about what it means to be in Christ or what it means to be in the Lord because he says to rejoice in the Lord. You may know this already, but this phrase that Paul uses of in Christ, it's at least 160 times in the New Testament. I've heard it said that almost on every page in your Bible that Paul writes, you're going to find in Christ or in the Lord or in Him. It's just this thing that we're in Christ, in Christ. It really describes our relationship with Him. It describes, did you know that the word Christian is not really in the New Testament but like three times? It is mentioned Christian. Uh, A couple of times it's derogatory because it was when the word first came about and they said Christians, you know, those people, they're Christians. They're like Christ, and so they called them Christians. But it wasn't a very positive way to describe them. I think there's one positive use of the word Christian in 1 Peter or somewhere like that. But the real way that Paul described us was in Christ that we're in Him, that we're in the Lord. This is the way we need to view ourselves as united with Christ. Because what this gives us is identity. When we know that, that that's our identity, that changes so much. We tend to think that who we really are is our besetting sins or is our things that we're trying to get over. Oh, I did that again. I fell into that. That's just the way I am. I'm never going to get past that. We kind of define ourselves by our defeats. Instead of defining ourselves by the fact that we are in Christ, and that's who we really are. And if we know that that's our identity, then that changes how we live. We we live from that position in Christ. That's how we live. It's kind of like when Pastor Amber talked about how we're supposed to work from rest, not rest from work. We're supposed to live from our identity in Christ, not live trying to create our identity in Christ or trying to earn our identity in Christ. We're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves, right? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. That's our identity is in Christ. So I really want, if you don't get anything else out of what I'm saying today, I want you to get this thing about being in Christ or being in the Lord or being in Him. And then as you do your devotions, as you read the Bible, as you look at this, let this get into you over and over and over again. Start looking for it and underlining it and uh, asking the Lord to reveal to you what it is. So much so, I want to kind of illustrate it a couple of different ways today. Um, my mom gave me these envelopes. To, my mom is such a teacher. She gave me these envelopes uh, a long time ago. I've used this before, but it's been many years now. So I don't know if any of y'all, many of y'all were here back then, but... This little stick figure, I just drew drew this last night. This represents you. How's that? (laughs) Can you see the little stick figure? This is you. And Anthony's going to come help me. I'm going to challenge Anthony here. I'm going to give you, this is you. This is Jesus. Y'all see Jesus on this card? This is Jesus. Again, a little bigger. (laughs) And this is God. 
So now I'm going to read these verses. I have them on my back of a note, but I think I have them right here too. I can read them. I have three different verses, and the challenge for Anthony is he's got to act out these verses. See if you can follow along. You may have to help him a little bit. He's got to put this together like a puzzle almost, right? So it says in John 14, 20, on that day, oh, I could preach about what that day is, right? The day of the Lord. On that day, we're going to know a lot of things. But on that day when he returns, right, it says, you will realize that I am in my Father. This is Jesus speaking. So you got to put Jesus in the Father. I think that'll work. Jesus is in the Father. And you are in me. Into Jesus, that's right. And then I am in you. He did it. See, the look, Jesus is going in him. Yeah, show him the envelopes again. There we go. Good job. Give him a hand. That's great. There you go. And then, so Jesus is in you. You're in Jesus. And then Jesus is in the Father, right? So if the enemy has to come against you, he has to come against the Father and get through the Father, and then he has to get through Jesus, right? And then if he even got through the Father and he got through Jesus, then he'd have to get through round two of Jesus because Jesus is inside of you as well, right? That's your identity, and that's who you are. Another way it said, it says, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So your life is hidden in him, right? You're hidden down in here, right? <laughs> we could find you. There you are. But you're hidden down in there. You're in the Father. You're in Jesus, you know, and then Jesus is also inside of you as well. It, you're you're going to find this in even more places than I'm sharing with you. But another one is in John 17. Remember the prayer that he prayed in John 17? He said, my prayer is that all of them may be one. Jesus is saying all of them may be one. Who is them? That's us, right? All of us may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. No, that's okay. Um, just as I am in me and you, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So remember these envelopes as you remember who your identity is in Christ and who you are. That's what you have. So rest in that. Realize that you don't have to create this relationship with him. and You don't have to walk around in fear worrying about that. Yes. That one, that last one that I read is John 17. What's that? The envelopes. Yes. John 17, 20 and 21. Colossians 3.3 3, and John 14.20. And then there's some other ones as well. I think there's one in Romans 6 maybe. Maybe it's Romans 6.5 there where it talks about our, our baptism. And it even talks about the Jew and the Gentile and how we're one in Christ and then we're in Christ as one new people and all these. You're going to see it over and over again now that, that the Lord's awakening this revelation in you. I pray that it, it's alive in you. So if you're in a truck and you drive from here to Marshall, Texas, right? How long did it take? Four hours, right? To drive in the truck. But if you were depending upon yourself, if you weren't in the truck, right? If you weren't in Christ going there, it would take you two days and 17 hours, 65 hours of walking. So you do, do you want to live in the Lord? Or do you want to walk this life without him? And maybe that's what your life feels like. You feel like you've been walking for five days. <laughs> that's because you're doing it in your own strength, right? We have to learn how to rejoice in the Lord and place ourselves in His power to do these things, right? Another way to illustrate this, because I'm trying to get you to take this with you about being in Christ. I heard this years ago about a lion and how a lion's vision how God created lions, like an African, imagine the African safari lion, you know, with the big mane and everything, and he's on the, he's on the, what's that called? He's not on the safari. 
Yeah, he's on the plains there in the Serengeti Desert or somewhere like that, right? Kruger, what's it called? Kruger National Park down there in Africa. My mother-in-law has been there and seen him. The lion's eyes are made to where, you, if you look at a picture of a lion now, the fur right underneath their eyes is, is, is white, is whiter. It's a very light color. And that helps reflect into their eyes better. And they have rods and cones in their eyes, just like you have rods and cones in your eyes. I don't know if we have any eye doctors in here. Maybe somebody watching online is an eye doctor. They have rods and cones. They don't have as many cones, so they can't see the colors we do. They have more rods, but they can see eight times better than we can at night. So they've got this amazing vision. But even with this amazing vision and the way God created them, and I don't think that just happened through natural selection and survival of the fittest, right? I think that had to happen. God designed that. Just incredible design that God put into that. But also, even with that great vision, eight times better than ours, they can't decipher you separate if you if you stay in the truck. You know, you, you see these safari trucks that are going through Kruger National Park, and they're open-aired. Even an open-air Jeep, if you will stay in the truck, if you'll stay in the Lord, right? If you stay in the truck, they can't see you separate from the truck. And those things are going through there all the time, and they get used to those things. So they, they can't, they can't pick, you're one with the truck. You're one with it, Right? So don't stand up out of the open air thing and then you change the silhouette of the truck and you look different. You know, don't hop out. You're right there beside them and they're that close to you, you know, um, but don't get out and think that they're a kitty cat, right? And pet them kind of thing. There have been attacks and people, been, they think, they get so comfortable with it, right? And they get out of the truck and they get attacked like that. That's a picture of us being in Christ, in the Lord we need to stay in the truck, right? We'll have the power to get there a lot, you know, like to get to Marshall, right? We'll get the power to get there. Then we also have like the protection and the identity and the unity of being with Christ. And we have the same unity that God and Jesus have. We are one with him as well. That'll blow your mind. I don't know how to comprehend that. Okay, keep going. The next phrase there in verse 2, I believe that we're in. We're supposed to rejoice in the Lord. It also says that it is not a, what does he say? Is not, I never get tired of telling you things, these things, but I do it to safeguard your faith. He doesn't get tired of telling them these things. He wants to safeguard their faith. It must be pretty important to safeguard our faith. So how do you safeguard your faith? But I want to com- I want to um, do a little comparison contrast here because in this verse when he's talking about safeguarding your faith, he also talks about these dogs, these evil workers. He says they are Dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. I'm going to describe them for you and tell you a little bit more about them and why he was using that language, but I think they were trying to safeguard the faith. These dogs were following Paul around and trying to change the message that Paul was preaching. They were Messianic Jews. They believed in Jesus. They weren't Orthodox Jews who were going around. Sometimes he got in trouble with Orthodox Jews and thrown away and thrown in prison. Maybe the first time he went into town and he started preaching about Jesus, some of the Jews were more like Orthodox Jews and they threw him in prison. But now these Jews were Messianic Jews and they believed in Jesus, but they believed that you had to add to that and you had to keep the Jewish law and you had to stay circumcised. So they would follow him around. They would even chase him from one town to the next town and get him in trouble the next town, and try to go back behind him. He would plant a church, and they were trying to safeguard the faith that they believed in, and go back and say, no, it's not enough. Paul told you that it's enough to just live by grace, but they would tell him, no, you got to keep the Jewish law as well. And Paul came on pretty harsh on these dogs. Even just by calling them dogs, he was calling them. But you may think, um, 
oh, dogs are cute, right? You know, dogs are, Alan brought a dog to class one time, right? <laughs> you may have a little dog. We have the sweet little dog named Hank, right, at our house. And he's so loving. He is not a good watchdog because he is just so loving and uh, just wants to be petted all the time. But that's not the kind of dog he was talking about here. This is referring to like in, in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 23, this dog, this same word was used of a cult male prostitute. He was called a dog. That's how negative a term this was. And these dogs were like the packs of wild dogs that were vicious, that would eat the trash, that would attack people, that traveled in herds. These were not domesticated dogs that we spend a lot of money on as our pets, right? These dogs were not safe. And they were dogs, they were like a herd uh, tracking down uh, these Christians and uh, trying to make them keep the law as well. So he talks about them as dogs. He says that they're evil people. And then he also says that they are mutilators of the flesh. This mutilators of the flesh, this is the same language. It reminds us when you study it in the original and you go from this in the New Testament to the Old Testament, it reminds us of the same language that was used when um, Elijah fought the prophets of Baal, or he had his little contest. And actually, Pastor Amber mentions this in the sermon, so listen for it if you haven't been in there yet. She mentions the Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And, you know, there were 450 of these prophets, and they built this altar, and uh, they were asking their God to send the fire down and burn up the altar. And, you know, Elijah, he was in the Lord, I guess. He was even cocky in the Lord a little bit. <laughs> But his, his confidence was in the Lord. He believed his God was going to do it. So he told him, maybe your God's asleep, right? And all this. Is, so they would scream even louder and stuff. And then they started cutting themselves and mutilating their flesh to get their God's attention. That's what they did in that pagan religion. They mutilated their flesh. That's the same word here of mutilating your flesh. So he's taking that and he's saying, they're telling you, you have to, you have to be circumcised to be saved. You're just mutilating your flesh. What a graphic image that is. He called them dogs and evildoers. But he is driving home a clear message once you see it like that, like they would have seen it. What a clear message that we don't have to keep the law. and We don't have to do those outward signs. It's about the circumcision of the heart. We see that in other places where Paul writes that it's the circumcision of our hearts. It's a spiritual circumcision. It's also in this passage. Look at verse 3. Verse 3 contains a lot of theology, actually. It says, For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. See, that's the way we live this Christian life, is that we worship by the Spirit of God, and that makes us truly circumcised, like a circumcision of the heart. We rely on what Jesus has done for us. That's faith. Not just faith for salvation, but we rely on what he's done for us to just live this life. And then it says we put no confidence in human effort. Maybe your application to today is to look at what am I relying on with my human effort? We're probably not relying on obeying the Jewish laws, right? I don't, I don't know of any of us that are struggling with that, right? But we are relying on our own human effort, probably on our finances, or we're relying on our education, or relying on our wits, you know, just our smarts to do something, or we're relying on our, our, our looks, or our image, or our reputation, or what is it for you that you're relying on that is human effort, that maybe God's trying to put on the altar <laughs> and get rid of, right? And you need to offer that up and just declare yourself, dead to those things and alive in Christ. That's what he's communicating here. So we do need to safeguard our faith. He said, I don't get tired of it. There in verse 1, he says, I, don't, I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. So we do safeguard our faith, but not like these dogs that were chasing him around and trying to change the message. We're trying to safeguard the faith. He gives them the true message there in verse 3. So study that. Verse 3, a little bit more on your own. Are you picking up any applications? 
just to review a little bit, you know, the application of being in the Lord. Ask Him to really show you what that means and what that looks like. And then, how are you safeguarding the faith? Well, we safeguard the faith. Congratulations, you're here. You're safeguarding your faith by being in Bible study, learning what God says, uh, seeking it out, knowing His truth. But we have to put it in our lives every day, right? We have to be doing this on our own and not just uh, when we come here on Sundays for somebody else to feed us, right? We need to be learning how to feed ourselves as well. So, just to kind of review back down through these three verses, he starts out with whatever happens, which kind of means like, furthermore, let me tell you this. And then he says, my dear brothers and sisters, he's telling them out of love, and then he says, rejoice in the Lord. That's where we put our joy is in the Lord. And we learn that that's our identity that gives us who we are and gives us unity also. And then he says, I never get tired of telling you these things. You see, a good instructor always, re- a good instructor always repeats himself. Let me say that again. <laughs> a good instructor, oh wait, yeah. A good instructor always repeats himself, right? We know that from education, right? Education is a lot about repetition, right? So he says, I never get tired of telling you these things. He says, and I do it to safeguard your faith. So we are supposed to safeguard our faith. But he says, watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil. He actually said, it is evil to lead people astray. Like, what did Jesus say? He said, it'd be better for you to tie a millstone, a big heavy rock to you and be thrown into the sea than to lead one of these little ones, astray. And then he says, those mutilators, what a graphic term, who say you must be circumcised to be saved. And then verse 3, lots of theology in this verse. For we worship by the Spirit of God and are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us, and we put no confidence in human effort. So as we close, finally... Right As we close, uh, think about your application. We're going to close in prayer. Ask the Lord to reveal to you what it means to be in Him. And then ask Him, oh, and remember the part about Him being your master, submitting to His spiritual authority in your life. That's where you can put your confidence. Not in your own human effort, but maybe you literally say, teach me how to see you as my master and as my spiritual authority. So let's end there today with prayer. Father God, please show us these things. Give us your revelation about who we are in Christ. Give us your revelation about your authority in our lives and how our joy comes from you. Help us to rest in what you have done and not in our not to put any confidence in our own human effort. Show us specific things that we might need to tweak in our lives. Help us to repent and ask forgiveness. I challenge you to do that right now. Uh, Tell them you're sorry. Tell them, forgive me for putting my confidence in my own human effort. I trust you. I lean not on my own understanding, and I trust you to direct my steps. Pray that right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Reveal these things to us. Take these things deep into our hearts. May we know what it means to be in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you.